Mayor said, don't forget to vote. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you very much. You know, I, I want to say, before we start the Q&A, uh, one of the great things that, we, that I think is managed with this is that most every head of department in this film is from Toronto. I wanted to make very, very clearly that this is not a movie that comes to Toronto for a rebate, uses the CD and gets the fuck out of there. <laughs> it's a movie that values uh, custom design, production design, exquisite sound design, you know, and some of the partnerships in this film are invisible, you know, or, and I want to underline them, or partnership with Deluxe, and our partnership with the extraordinary Mr. X. We tried to make it as close to a Canadian movie as we could with a Mexican in the middle. The Danish guy in cinematography, fuck it. But uh, I, I don't know, we, for the Q&A we need the cues, so I don't know if we're gonna do this, but if you guys wanna ask uh, anything of any of us, We'll be delighted. Yes. Yeah. You. <laughs> yeah, we were, uh, you know, Daniel and I were having the breakfast, and, and, and then he said, you know, I, I said, hey, what else do you have? And he said, well, we were working on 1200, and he said, well, this idea, I'm at the janitor, Working as you and, and the, the, the key to that for me is the ideas I wanted to put in the movie, the reversal I wanted to have in the movie, which was to make the image of the creature carrying the, the girl a beautiful image as opposed to a horror image, and make the guy that is usually the good guy in the 50s sci fi movies with a nice suit and a square jaw and a gun, make him the bad guy, blah, blah, blah. And when he said that, the, I said, Of course, we go through the janitors. I have done Hellboy 1, Hellboy 2, and I said, I would love to see those super secret government facilities from the people that clean the piss. You know, and, and have to pick up the chewing gum from the floor. That's the entrance to it, because they are invisible people. So everybody that rescues the creature is invisible to the eyes of a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant guy. You know, everybody, all of them, including a Russian spy and so forth. So the moment you find the entrance, the, the other entrance into a big building, the building looks completely different. Mm -hmm. So that was a conversation that, that started to change it. Uh, yes? Um, I just want to congratulate you on the great film. And just in general, your film is very inspirational to me. And I'm wondering if that's something that's Oh, well, the, the, my. My Hispanic roots, my Mexican roots are with me all the time this morning. I reference my, my head, my gut, and my cojones. <laughs> as eminently Mexican. You know, because because uh, it, it, is, it is, we are who we are. We, it, we would be, it would be impossible for us to deny our roots, even if we tried and tried and tried. So, yes, but the main thing for me is uh, when I was a kid, I, I've, I've been, you know, I wanted to make uh, movies with monsters since I was a child. And I've never betrayed them. i never betrayed them at all. And, and for me, the important thing as a Hispanic is to, to just exist as an example of a very deranged fat fucker. Go <laughs> <laughs> away with it. You know, and for other crazy slim or fat fuckers in Latin America to be able to dream of our favor to be able to dream of a fairy tale, to dream of parable, and not just be tied, you know, to... I think realism is amazing, but not every filmmaker has to be realistic in that sense, just be emotionally realistic. And I think that we self... Many of our organisms that rule the government and governmental help for filmmaking try to say it's only valuable if it's social drama. And what I say is, no, there's art and beauty and power in the primal images of, of fantasy and power. 
very clever. That makes it a little easier, not much easier. That's unconscious. Yes, ma'am. He's asking me if it was a conscious decision not to give the creature a name. Yes, I mean, on the set we call him Charlie for Charlie Tuna. <laughs> Charlie, you know. But, but uh, you know, the idea, the creature is something for everyone that is completely different. It's, it's like a Salini theorem with a fish. And what, what, what do I mean? For Strickland, it's a dark, slimy thing that came from South America. You know, for Sally, it's something that she recognizes her nature and her essence in. You know, for uh, the Russian scientist, is something that reconnects him with what made him a scientist. So, so each of them sees it differently. For Giles, there's a beauty and an innocence. And he's, I think, the first one to recognize him sort of a, as a god, even if he ate a cat. You know? <laughs> so each of them sees them differently, and I thought, I, I wanted to keep the creature open and just, uh, for me, the, one of the best lines which we improvised on the set that day is like when he says, interesting guy. <laughs> he's, he's seen weirder guys. Yeah. <laughs> 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 experiences that were more coruscated. <laughs> no, but, but I thought it was nice to keep it open for everyone. You know. It's in the balcony. I said it in 1962 specifically because uh, when, when, when the people say, let's make America great again, they're dreaming of that era. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, it's an era where the cars had jet fins, the kitchens were automatic, the, the ladies had hairspray hairdos. And it was really, really a, a sort of, America was looking at the future, the, the space race, Everything was super great if you were white Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. Yeah. But if you were anything else, you were fucked. <laughs> so it, it, it hasn't changed is it? much, not much. So, and, and it's, it's a dream that dies with Kennedy and with the escalation of the Vietnam War. And it, it sort of gets crystallized into a carrot that is carried around as if it's a false memory of it, you know? So it was very important to set it in that time and to, and to you know, be as allegorical as we can without stomping the story, you know, but there's many, many, many allegorical elements in the film. They are color-coded or coded very carefully by me through the six years that took to develop this thing. But, but it, it's there just as a reflection of what can be done, and I think what can be done is that the Giles is one point of view. Why should we say it? You know, it's not even a thing. It's, a, it's not a human. It's a thing. And, you know, to see those characters be selfish and change, to be to be aware of the possibility that we can all change. I mean, I think we wake up in the morning and we can choose between fear and love every morning. And every morning, if you choose one, you know, that doesn't define you until the end. I think that our actions, we are bad and good every day, 24 times a day, but the way you end your story is very important, you know? Uh, you know, it's important that we choose love over fear because love is the answer. Silly as it may sound, it is the fucking answer to everything. <laughs> because that's a fucking trick. <laughs> and that's why the monster is important because I think when you fall in love with the beauty, that's infatuation. When you fall in love with the monster, that's why it's important that the, the, the characters are imperfect. Beauty and the beast. Beauty masturbates, smokes, like beauty's dog. 
what the fuck were they doing? People do it, everybody does it. And I, I wanted to show, I'm not a Disney fucking princess. You know, I wanted to show somebody real. And, and the, the, the creature eats the fucking cat. Because he's, he's a god, but he eats cats. <laughs> That's the answer for cats. So, I think that uh, in Hellboy there was a line, we like people for their qualities, but we love them for their defects. I think that's love. Love is saying, I'm screwed, you're screwed, but we're great together. <laughs> Somehow, you know? So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry for cursing, by the way. I know it's not very Canadian. <laughs> I'm very emotional. Right now. What is the hardest thing uh, I've ever done and the hardest thing on this movie? You know, I think the hardest thing is the movie you're making. Every day when we were making this movie, we would look. And the hardest thing really is to push yourself not to be safe. You know, if you get complacent and you like the, you know, the, 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 the super nice caravan and the, the driver at your door and all those things, and then you only make one type of movie to be safe, then that's bad. And if you stay risk, with risk, and sometimes you fail. And I think the worst thing that can happen to you is success early on, because it's completely disorienting. So failure is very instructive. And what's the hardest thing in this movie? Just imagine that we crammed a $60 million movie on 19.5 million. So we crammed it in to that size and then tonally trying to keep an open mind and yet letting everybody play and watching that everybody was in the tone. Because tone is a pedal. You know, and if anyone breaks the tone, the movie call collapses. And the cinematographer can break it, the wardrobe designer can break it, an actor can break it, and all you need to be is to let everybody play, but you're the, the guardian of that pedal, and you say, eh, that doesn't work. That's hard. And it only works with experience. You know? It takes a lot of time for that. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yes, ma'am, you. Her question, she has a son that is autistic, and she loved mine and Sally's relationship, and it gave, gives her hope that um, her son will find love. I, uh, I'll let you take that first. I don't know a beautiful thing to say, it's really moving. Um, I, I did a film about an autistic child, a mother of an autistic child, and I read this beautiful book that actually sort of, it, um, it's why I, I, it will come to me and I'll, I'll try and think a bit, but it's about why I jump. Um, that's the title, and it was written by a 13-year-old autistic child, and it's so moving, and how he sees the world. And yet it felt so um, recognizable as everyone because um, it, it just, it was the most beautiful poetry and true. And um, yeah, it made a lot of sense. And there's, I, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Well, but I, I'll, I'll jump in there, Sally, <laughs> now that I've composed myself. <laughs> really terrible thing to do to toss that ball. <laughs> but uh, here's the thing. My, I have a, a brother who is deaf. And um, this is my He didn't want my sisters and I to learn sign language. Uh, he wanted us to talk to him. 
even though he's, he's supposedly a deputy, but he talks more than anybody I know. <laughs> um, and he didn't want us to learn sign language because he wanted to feel like he was a part of us. And I regret it to this day that I just didn't do it on my own. So it was kind of fun to learn some things uh, from this movie. Um, and I think I, I, he reads lips, you know, uh, so it's, it's cool that he understands us, but, you know, he has to write everything down for us to understand him. So to go back to your, your uh, statement about your son, I think your son will find love, find friends who, you know, you meet your tribe. This is our tribe, you know. Thank you. Thank you. One truth I learned, I'm 52 and I learned up like three truths, is that right? One is that out of whatever hinders us, come four uh, qualities. And what makes us unique. You know, so, it really, we are most of us inadequate miracles, you know. That, you know, if you believe in, 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 in that person, in that love, the world changes. You just have to, you, have, you just have to open that and, and understand that and it, it will be, you know, when we see the standards, the ideology that we get of what is normal and what it isn't is the most fucked up thing in the world. It is, because it makes it impossible. And I, 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 I say this, perfection is the thing that makes us all unhappy. And imperfection and loving it is what makes us all happy. And it's a, a, a clearly attainable goal. Mm -hmm. You say, you're going to be perfect. <laughs> if I tell you, hey, that's being perfect. Absolutely fucking no. Now, Guillermo, before we go, we have a special surprise for a couple of people in this historic theater. Your seats are rigged to explode. Do <laughs> <laughs> not fucking go or go under 50 miles an hour. <laughs> Miles did the surprise. By the way, happy birthday, Gary. Big shout out to some guys who don't get some recognition. Our incredible production designer, Paul Osterberry. Yeah. Amazing visual effects here for Mr. X, run by uh, our dear friend, that guy who basically went out of business on this movie. Uh, there'll be a tin can out the door if you can just drop a spare tin can in it. Dennis Perardi. Costume designer Louis Sicara and his incredible team. Sean, Paula, Jordan, all of you, we love you all. Thank you for putting your heart and soul into this. So, as a reward for staying so long tonight, all of you, um, how crazy and surreal was it to be sitting in this theater when this theater came? <laughs> the history of this place and upstairs look into it because it's amazing. Um, two sheets. If you were in C28 or M32, this is where the fish and uh, uh, where Charlie and Eliza and Matt, and that's where the guy got the water dropped in his mouth. We've got a signed poster, original poster of the movie that Guillermo is going to sign for you. So you're so you're those sheets and, uh, Thank you all so much for coming. Amazing.